to the cloud. Good evening, folks. Welcome to the next in our series on the Gospel of Luke. We're going to begin this evening with a reading from Psalm 45. Psalm 45, which reads, My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The people fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, and consider, incline your ear, forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber, with roses interwoven with gold. In many colored robes she is led to the king, with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. In place of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. An interesting psalm in that it's a wedding psalm, a triumphant entry, an entry psalm. Um, and sometimes it's not clear about who's, who exactly it's speaking of as, uh, as, as the theme moves along. A lot of people like to apply it to the church and to Jesus looking forward to his role as Messiah, which is what we're going to be looking at in some detail this evening as we continue pushing forward through Luke uh, in chapter 9 this evening, looking at verses 1 through 20. I know I read most of them last week, but I want to reread it just to um, seat it more firmly in our minds this evening before we uh, get any further into it. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, and he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. On their return, the apostles told him of all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had, heal who had need of healing. Now the day was beginning to wear away. And the twelve came and said to him, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men, and he said this to his disciples, and he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them 
all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. And he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. An interesting uh, section. This is the, the end point of the first major movement within the Gospel of Luke. Um, I call it the halfway point, even though it isn't halfway through the physical gospel, it's halfway through the mission of what Jesus is doing, because up to this point, the question of who is this man, who is Jesus, has been hanging in the background. And when Jesus brings it into the foreground and Peter makes that confession, from that point forward, Jesus is going to focus on his disciples and start teaching them in earnest um, mostly what it means to be Messiah, but also training them for the mission that they're going to be carrying out once he has gone to the cross and, and satisfied the wrath of God and then risen and, and ascended back up to heaven. But first he has to send them out on their own. They've been, since the beginning, uh, the especially from Luke chapter 8, verse 1, Luke has really directed the reader's attention to the fact that the disciples are with him. Everywhere that Jesus goes, they're hearing what he's teaching, they're seeing what he's doing. And within that larger group of disciples, the 12, the core group is there at his side for everything that he's doing. And so in order for them to carry out the mission that they're going to be carrying out once uh, Pentecost happens and, and the, the church begins, they have to go out on their own uh, and learn how to do the things that Jesus is going to have them do. I, I say here, and I mentioned this in Rome yesterday when I was speaking there, that no one becomes proficient at doing a thing simply from watching YouTube videos on how to do a thing. Uh, an example, one of the examples I shared at Rome is a couple of weeks ago, the, dry, the belt that drives the drum of our, of our clothes dryer snapped. And I replaced it. I went to Schenectady to a, an, auto, uh, an auto parts place, an appliance parts place, and bought the belt there. And from watching a YouTube video, learned how to take the dryer apart and put it back together. And I got it running. But when I was reassembling it, I noticed that the idler pulley that, that tensions the belt wasn't in the best shape. And I told my wife that it probably wasn't going to last very long. And it lasted less than 24 hours before I had to order one and, and replace it. But when I went to replace the pulley, I had watched that video. I knew what I was doing. So I repeated those steps and I got the pulley in place and I did through a lot of struggle and effort, finally got the belt wrapped around the pulley because it was really tight and plugged it in and hit that start button and it wouldn't start. It wouldn't go. And it took me taking the dryer apart another two times to realize that I had not reconnected the um, dryness sensors. The little tiny electrical strips there that tell the dryer how wet the load is and automatically shut it off when it's dry. So I didn't gain proficiency by watching that YouTube video once. Now, if I were to take it apart and put it back together again, I think I would know better how to do so. Um, the example I usually use for this is that you can watch a video on how to drive a, stand, a stick shift automobile, but not until you get behind the wheel of one and push in the clutch and, and engage the gear select and take your foot off of that clutch, do you begin to learn. Do you begin to gain proficiency at doing that thing? And if you do it for weeks and, and months and years, you become adept at it. But nobody's going to watch the video on how to do this and say, well, I know how to do this thing. 
Um, you might have the head knowledge, but you don't have the experience, the experience of the knowledge gained by experience that Jesus really wants. And so this is why he sends the, he sends the apostles out. He sends them out and he gives to them authority. He gives them authority over demons. He gives them authority over diseases and he commissions them to preach the message of the kingdom. And they go about doing this in all the towns. Um, he sent them out to heal. And in verse six, it says they departed and they went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So they carried out the mission that Jesus gave them. They were able to do things that uh, they would not otherwise have been able to do on their own. Uh, they need to learn to trust God to provide because he says, don't take any provisions with you. Whatever home you stay, you welcomes you stay there until you move on to the next village and if the village doesn't welcome you then symbolically shake the dust off of your uh, sandals as you leave and let them be they're, they're going to suffer in judgment the unasked question here though is and i'm reading this into the text who has the authority to impart what is truly a divine power, uh, power from God to these men, to these fishermen and, and, and tax collectors and, and men from other walks of life. If, if we say that Frank has the gift of teaching and um, let's say Bill Moore doesn't, Frank can put his hands on Bill all day long Bill's not going to gain that gift from Frank laying his hands on him. We don't have that ability. I can't impart a gift to anybody. So who is it that has the ability to impart this gift to these men? Who has the authority? Um, well, some Chad wrote into, into chat, obviously Jesus does. So there's a level of something going on here that is beyond the expectations of the people who are looking toward a Messiah, who are expecting a Messiah to come. They expect him to be able to do miracles, but to be able to pass that ability on to others, that's something that falls outside of the realm of their expectations. And so the report of Jesus spreads, Herod Antipas hears of it and begins wondering to himself, who is this man that I'm hearing these things about? He's hearing the speculation of the people. And uh, it said, the text says that he sought to see him at the end of verse nine. Well, he must not have sought very hard because he doesn't see Jesus until chapter 23 and verse six, when Pilate sends Jesus to Herod. Uh, essentially saying, let Herod deal with him. Pilate didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. Let, let Herod deal with him. And he goes to before Herod and Herod doesn't get the answers he wants. He's hoping to see a miracle. He's expecting a dog to perform tricks. And Jesus doesn't perform tricks for anybody on command. And so Herod sends him back to Pilate. And we'll see him. We'll see that when we get to Luke chapter 23 and oh, what, another eight months or so at the rate we're going through the gospel of Luke. But he asks that question, who is this about whom I hear such things? And Luke moves from that question immediately into this uh, incident where Jesus feeds this large group of people. It recalls an incident from Second Kings in chapter four, a miracle performed by Elisha. In 2 Kings 4, beginning in verse 42, it says that a man from Baal, Shalishah, bringing, uh, a man came from Baal, Shalishah, bringing the man of God, that is Elisha, bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, give it, give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them and they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. So here is a miracle in the Old Testament, a miraculous feeding. 
of a hundred men with a little bit more food than what the disciples are dealing with here. And I think this Luke places this miracle here specifically because it helps to answer the question, who is this? Who is, who is Jesus that is starting to pinball around these people? And I find it very interesting when Jesus, the disciples come to Jesus and they state to him the obvious, um, hey, we're in, a, we're in a remote place. The day is wearing on these things Jesus can see for himself. We need to, we need to disperse the crowds so that they can go and find lodging. They can go and find provisions. Um, and kind of, they want some alone time too. If you read Mark's account, they haven't even slept yet. And they've been at this all day. And Jesus has been teaching and he's been healing people and the disciples are there and they're, they're bound to be getting tired by now. And they just want the crowd to go away. But Jesus turns to them and says, you give them something to eat. Which I've always thought is an interesting, an interesting thing for him to say. And it makes me wonder, and I don't like to speculate about God's word, but I do anyway. What would have happened if the disciples said, okay, and took with the, what the food that they had and began handing it out to people? If they had acted on what Jesus said to do, remember Jesus gave them authority. And when they went out to the on their mission, he said, take with you nothing, no staff, no bag, no bread, teaching them that God will provide. When they went out on this mission work, none of them, none of them came back and reported, hey, you know, no food, no lodging, what's up with that? I didn't get, I, nobody took care of me. God's taking care of them. And, but the disciples are very short-sighted, as are we. They come up with two answers. We've got five loaves and two fish, not enough food. We could go and buy food for this crowd, but we don't probably don't have enough money. We're caught here between these two options, insufficient resources, insufficient funds. And you want us to do what with this now? And so they're, they're really struggling with this. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Which he wouldn't say to them if they weren't able to do what he's directing them to do. Not that they're the ones who are going to do it. But God's going to work through them. But instead, they're, they're, too, they're flummoxed. And, and I understand the they're overwhelmed by this is too big a problem for us to handle Jesus. We need you to step in and, and, and take care of things. And so Jesus tells them to have the crowd seated. They sit down in groups of 50 ish, uh, 5,000 men plus women, plus children. Jesus blesses the food and gives it to the 12 to distribute. Who notices that the miracle is happening? There's no response of fear and wonder in Luke's account. Okay, we'll look at John in just a moment. So those of you who are about to type, type in, hey, they responded, they reacted in John. Yes, I'm aware of that. But Peter has his basket of food and he goes to a group of 50 and he begins handing stuff out. He doesn't run back to Jesus for a refill. There's no great pile of, of loaves of bread and and smoked fish behind them. But he's handing out the food and he's handing out the food and he's handing out the food and the basket doesn't get empty. And so this great crowd receives all the food that they want. And in verse 17, it says they all ate and were satisfied and what was left was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Uh, when we went through the Gospel of Mark, we talked about the significance of those 12 baskets. 
but it's interesting that I don't think the people were really aware before they picked up the food. I don't, the leftovers, I don't think they were really aware of what was going on because I think people tend to be fairly unobservant. Uh, I speak as one such, I'm the king of the oblivious people. Um, I don't normally make connections of one plus one and I'll sit there scratching my head until my wife says, hey, it adds up to two. And then I marvel at her wisdom because it's right and, and it works. But I think the people were unaware. They do, it doesn't dawn on them that, hey, these guys have been circulating and there's an awful lot of us and those baskets they have are kind of small and obviously can't be holding that much food. But it's not until they pick up and it, it, you turn, turn over to John 6. We're going to come back to it in, in uh, a couple more, two or three more slides here. But in John chapter 6, in verse 12, and when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Now they're, now they're amazed. They picked up more food than they handed out. How's that work? And yet we ate and we're all full. Something amazing has taken place here and they're, they're puzzled by it and their response is, here's the Messiah. Here is the Christ. Here is the one we've, we've been looking for. And verse 15, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. That becomes important in just a in just a couple of in just a couple of moments. If you look at Psalm 81 and verse 6 13. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him. Their fate would last forever, but he would feed you with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. And the verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 25, verse 6, speaks of, the, of, of Israel feasting on the mountain with God. Who can provide such an abundance? of food out of so little, obviously Jesus can. And it calls to mind the manna in the wilderness. These people are out, out there in the wilderness and suddenly they have bread to eat, bread that comes from no discernible source. And they look at Jesus and the question has to be going through their mind, who is this man? The disciples are aware of what's going on. By the time Peter handed out his 50th fish, he probably caught on that, hey, we started with two. And I've handed out bunches of them. Something remarkable is taking place here. And it had to have put them in awe of the power of Jesus. And so we move into the area where I want to spend the most time this evening now that we're halfway through class. Fractions. I'm not good with them. Jesus is alone by himself praying and the disciples were with him. I'll let you puzzle on that statement for a while. He's surrounded by his disciples and yet he's alone praying. He turns to the disciples now that they're alone. The crowd is, just, is, is gone and, and they finally have some time to themselves. And he asks the question, uh, who, do the, who do the crowds say that I am? Luke omits the, the setting that Mark and Matthew both focus on, the, the uh, area of Caesarea Philippi and Gentile territory that, he, that Peter first uh, confesses that Jesus is the Christ, which is sort of a strange thing. But if you're studying Mark, it's more important than it is here in Luke. Luke is pointing at Jesus praying. Every time before a great revelation or a momentous moment in the ministry of Christ, we find him praying. He prayed at his baptism. He prayed before choosing the 12. He prayed at, here at Peter's confession. 
He's going to be praying in the Transfiguration, which we'll look at next week. He prays at Gethsemane, and in the last moment of his life, he utters a prayer, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The great, the, the big moments of Jesus' ministry are always prefaced by a prayer. And he takes this opportunity now that he's prayed, he turns to the disciples and says, who do the crowds say that I am? We have in, in Luke, there are at least four divisions of those who are interested in Jesus. We have the apostles, Luke chapter six, verses 13 to 16, where he was praying and he calls his disciples to him. And from that group chooses 12 that he names apostles. So we have the apostles, we have a larger group, the disciples, those who are following Jesus around and really listening to him and allowing the word to, to really penetrate and change them and compel them to follow after Jesus. We have the women who are ministering to Jesus and his disciples out of their own means that we read about in Luke chapter eight, verses one to four. And then there's the crowds. The crowds are the other group. They're the outside group, if you will. The group that comes out to see Jesus, they're potential disciples. I'm sure some of them hear what Jesus has to say or are healed by him and become disciples. But for the most part, they're coming out to see the oddity. They've heard the reports. They're coming out to, you know, I got nothing better to do this afternoon. Let's go out to the wilderness to this Jesus. Maybe we'll see a miracle. Maybe we'll see something astounding. Let's go and see and hear for ourselves what this is about. Men like Simon the Pharisee is one of them. A man who invited Jesus into his home for dinner because he'd heard the, re the reports of Jesus and wanted to see for himself who is this that the people are saying a great prophet has arisen among us. And while Jesus is there, in comes a sinful woman crying at his feet, and Simon makes his decision right there. This man isn't a prophet. Otherwise, he'd know what type of woman this is, is touching him. Simon chooses there. I, I, I like how Luke leaves that story open-ended, suggesting that perhaps Simon learned from the lesson that Jesus taught. But the speculation of the crowds is that Jesus is a forerunner to someone else to come, the Messiah. Uh, he's a forerunner. He's another John the Baptist. John the Baptist was, as we know, he was the forerunner, the one that he was Elijah to come, the one preparing the way of the Lord. And then Jesus turns to the disciples and says, okay, who do you say that I am? This is the first time in the gospel that Jesus calls for them to choose them to make a statement of, okay, you've been with me this long. What do you think? Who am I? He puts them on the spot. It implies that the answers that the crowd is giving are inadequate. They fall short of who Jesus really is. And Peter's answer contrasts greatly with the idea that Jesus is a mere prophet. He says, you are the Christ of God. And I'm sorry for the Greek and the Hebrew there. Um, but it's important in the way that Luke uses the term Christ in his gospel. All the gospel writers use the word Christ. Um, Matthew uses it more than Luke does. But I think Luke is the, the next highest in the count. And it's interesting that most of the instances that you find within the Gospels of the word Christ appearing are the word is on Jesus, the lips of Jesus' accusers. Are you the Christ? Um, this man says he's the Christ. You know, come down from the cross and, and save yourself, and then we'll believe you. It, it sort of hurled, it's thrown back in his face in an accusatory manner. But the word Christ from the, uh, from the Greek word Christos, which I'll tell my wife starts with uh, Kai and Ro, and uh, she'll get the joke there. It comes from the word, the Greek word, it's a translation of the Greek word Christos, which is a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach, uh, which means 
anointed, the one who is one who is anointed. There's three classes in the Old Testament of people who are anointed. We have prophets. Uh, Elijah was told to anoint Elisha to the prophet after him. Though I don't know that there is a record anywhere that I can think of in the Old Testament where a prophet is anointed by another prophet. Um, priests are anointed as Aaron and his sons were in Exodus chapter 28, and kings were anointed as David is in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13 by Samuel. But anointing was to a purpose. It was for a specific reason. One was anointed to a certain role to, to fulfill, to be the anointed to put the definite article in front of it and say, this is the anointed. That only appears once in the Old Testament, by the way. That's in uh, Daniel chapter 9. Now I'm on the wrong page of my notes. And verse 26. Daniel 9, 26. It's the only time it appears in, in Hebrew anyway with and in the Septuagint with a definite article in front of it saying, this is the anointed of God. But the idea of the Christ of God, um, Jewish, the Jewish outlook of who the Messiah was and what the Messiah would look like is really important for our, for our understanding of the disciples' difficulty in understanding the role that Jesus played out in his ministry. Uh, there were a lot of factors that influenced Jewish thought. There's very little written in the Old Testament that outlines exactly specifically who the Messiah is going to be and what the Messiah is going to look like. If you study the Old Testament, yes, you can find the scriptures that bear out the ministry of Jesus, but they don't say, this is what the Messiah is going to do. Jeremiah uh, 25 or 23 verse 5 speaks of God raising up a righteous branch to David. Because something's going to happen to Jerusalem and to the Davidic dynasty in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come into Jerusalem, break through the walls, tear the city down, burn the temple to the ground, throw down the king's palace, slay the, the sons of Zedekiah, the last Davidic king, and then Hall Zedekiah off in chains to Babylon where he dies. And we have the end of the line of David, apparently. Okay, apparently. I'm not saying David's line ended there, but there was, at, after that point, there was no king on the throne to whom you could point back and say, this is the son of David. Um, so they go off into Babylonian captivity. We know that they return after uh, the decree of Cyrus, which is another interesting thing. In Isaiah, sorry, sidetrack here. In Isaiah chapter 50 something. I thought it was 54. This is what the Lord says to the Lord's anointed. And he names him. And I can't, can't off the top of my head. Is it Isaiah 45? Yes, it is. Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped. One time in the Old Testament where a pagan king is called the Messiah or called the anointed of the Lord. Um, the Cyrus is going to be that in that he's going to rescue, he's going to release the people from captivity. Then after the Persian Empire falls to the Greeks, we have the Greek Civil War arises and it splits into four factions, two of which come to the fore, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, who was uh, from the Ptolemy's uh, division of the Grecian Empire, sets up an idol or sets up an altar in the courtyard of the temple and offers sacrifices to his God, thus defiling. And a lot of people point to Daniel at that time. But the point is a foreign power is desecrating and oppressing Jewish worship. 
And so once again, they are under, since the time of Babylon, once again, they're under the aegis of a foreign nation that is being abusive to them. Uh, the Maccabean revolt happens around 160 BC to throw off the, the Grecian uh, yoke. And they're successful to a, a degree and set up the Hasmonean dynasty, which runs from about 140 to 110 BC as a vassal state to the Seleucids. Again, still under foreign, uh, still under foreign rule. And then around 110 BC, they finally gain their freedom. And for 60 odd years or so, they're, they're free and they are finally their own nation once again ruling themselves and then in 63 bc here comes uh general pompey pompey the great of rome who comes into jerusalem captures the city and from that point forward the jews are under roman dominion and so they've spent from 586 bc with just a small little window of time to themselves beholden to or under the thumb of one foreign power or another. And by the time of Jesus, they have developed this theology of what the Messiah is going to look like. They have messianic expectations rather than when Nebuchadnezzar steamrolled Jerusalem, rather than ending the people's messianic hope, it fueled it. It ignited in them a fire because all of a sudden they're, they, they're, they no longer rule themselves. All of a sudden they have to point to somebody else and say, this person is king over me. And it's not a Jew. It's not a son of David. And so a hope begins to well up in them of the Messiah is going to come at any time now and free us from this thing. And they begin building on this idea of what the Messiah is going to be. He's going to be a human being, yes. Um, but he's going to be greater than any previous messenger that God has ever sent to us, like the prop, like the, even the great prophets. Uh, he's going to be mighty and wise in, uh, in the Holy Spirit. He's going to be endowed with miraculous powers. He's going to be holy. He's going to be free from sin. Um, I can't remember what book in the pseudepigrapha that comes from. I think it's the uh, Sibylline Oracles, but I'm not positive. And he's going to be the final anointed one, the, the ultimate, the one and true king of Israel. He's going to be the son of David, the ultimate son of David. Um, he's going to, as David did, free Israel and give, give Israel rest from her enemies all around. But as a son of David, he's going to be even greater than Solomon and rule with wisdom and, and, and bring prosperity and bring back the glory days of, of Israel. And the one that's not on the slide, he's going to deliver Jerusalem from the Gentiles. He's going to gather the faithful from where they've been dispersed. Wherever faithful Jews are, God is going to bring them back through his Messiah. And then he's going to rule in justice and glory forever. And that comes from the Psalms of Solomon and the thought that's developed there about 200-ish years before Jesus is born. The idea being that the Messiah was going to be the king over the faithful Jews. Even the Jews understood that not every Jew was faithful to God. Remember Simon the Pharisee, this woman is touching Jesus, she's a sinner. The objections raised to Jesus when he called Levi the tax collector and he's dining with tax collectors and sinners and the Pharisees are scratching their heads saying, what on earth? How can you call this man master when he's sitting there and defiling himself with these people and doing these things? And so these expectations are raised of Jesus, are raised of Anybody who comes along and sets himself up, Josephus writes about some who led groups out into the wilderness and, and stomped around and chanted and, and rattled their spears until Rome came in and, and smashed them flat. And Gamaliel refers to it in, in Acts chapter 5. So when you apply this lens to Jesus and you look at it through the eyes of the people and this expectation that they've been building up, you can see there's messianic expectations in the feeding. 
the people wanted to come and take Jesus by force and make him king in John. There's references in Luke's gospel to Jesus as the son of David. That's a messianic title. Looking to Jesus as the one who's going to be king over them. There's references to Jesus as king uh, in the, his triumphal entry. And Pilate asked him the question, are you, the, are you the king of the Jews? Are you a king? And the fact that Rome executed Jesus with the title statement over his head, Jesus, king of the Jews. All of these things point to the expectation of a militant Messiah. A guy who was going to come in and with the might of his right arm, throw off the oppression of Rome. And once again, establish Israel as an earthly kingdom under the rule of the ideal son of David forever and ever, amen. And all people would be in awe of Israel. And that's what they're looking for when they see or think of the Messiah. Either Chad or Christie writes, ironically, it was the cultural Jews, according to the Pharisees, is who Jesus came to minister, not the faithful, according to the Pharisees. That's true. Jesus comes to the, un, the great unwashed and not to the Pharisees, rather than uh, leading the Pharisees in triumphal charge against Rome. He goes to the tax collectors and the lepers and the sinners and the women who are bleeding and, and, and the poor. And it really puzzled the people. It puzzled the religious leaders who ultimately rejected him. So the question is, you have the Jewish definition of the Messiah. Who has the right to define what the Messiah is? Obviously, the Messiah has the right to define what the Messiah is. Bill Moore was a firefighter for the city of Albany for a bunch of years and rose to the rank of battalion chief. I have no idea what his duties entailed, uh, driving fire trucks fast and putting out fires. Only he told me once that he didn't get to put out fires anymore. He didn't get to have any fun. Uh, he didn't get to do the, do the things he liked to do. But beyond that, I don't know what battalion, what the title battalion chief fully entails. Bill could tell you, I can't tell you. So if I'm a Jew in the first century and I'm looking at the title Messiah, I'm not the Messiah, Jesus is. He has the right to tell me what it means. Um, you can't blame the ones looking for a warrior Messiah because in the past they have the judges as their example and they do. In the past, there has been military conquest throwing off the enemies of Israel. Uh, even when it wasn't Israel themselves throwing, them off, throwing off the enemies, Persia came in and, and wiped out Babylon to do, uh, to, to set the people free. And so when Jesus is called Messiah in Luke, Luke uses the term in a very curious way. And it's going to mean something to only a few of you uh, who, who probably have studied deeply into the Old Testament history. But twice in the infancy narratives, Jesus is referred to as the Messiah, as the Christ. Once by the angels who announce his birth to the shepherds in chapter 2, verse 11, using the term Christos Kyrios. And then by Simeon in the temple, who has been waiting for the, the consolation of Israel, and it was promised by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Exact same term in Greek, Christos Kyrios, the Lord's anointed. That's a term that is so rich with meaning to the Jews. The Lord's anointed. You remember David running for his life from Saul, hiding in a cave, and in comes Saul to relieve himself, and his men say, there he is. Go stick a knife in him. Take the kingdom. And David creeps up on him and cuts a, a hem of the, the corner of his robe. And then his conscience stricken. Why? Because he raised his hand against whom? The Lord's anointed. And the second time when Saul is asleep in the middle of the, the battlefield and all his soldiers asleep around him and, and uh, Joab's brother says... Let me go down there. I'll take a spear with me. I'll only have to strike once and you'll have the kingdom. And David again repeats the statement, 
you don't raise your hand against the Lord's anointed. Which is why, off on another tangent, which is why in Acts chapter 2, when Peter's preaching in the sermon on, on the day of Pentecost, it says in Acts 2, verse 23, this man, that is Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge to put him to death by nailing him to a cross. God intended for Jesus to die. And then he says later on in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified saying to the Jews, you killed the Lord's anointed. And every Jew knew what that statement meant. You don't raise your hand against the Lord's anointed. And so they're pierced to the heart. And they realize we're in a heap of trouble. And they cry out to Peter, men and brethren, what do we do? What do we do? We raised our hand against the Lord's anointed. But Jesus begins to redefine this statement back on track here. When Peter says, you are the Christ of God, meaning you are the Christ that belongs to God. You are the Christ from God. And as soon as Peter confesses that, Jesus immediately begins to define what that means. He says in verse 22 of Luke chapter 9, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. There's the definition. That's what Messiah means. Which is why, because remember that earlier lens that we were looking at? Militant guy, uh, powerful warrior going to throw off Rome, which is why Peter takes Jesus aside in Matthew 16 and says, what are you talking about? Messiahs don't die. You got it wrong. And Jesus turns to him and says, get behind me, Satan. Not because Jesus is offended by what Peter's saying, but he is because G Peter is saying to Jesus, you're the Christ of God. That is, you're come from God and you're carrying out his, his mission, but you got it wrong, Jesus. Peter's essentially saying the father's wrong. The father sent you for the wrong thing. So Jesus turns to him and calls him Satan, get behind me. You have your mind on the things of man and not the things of God. You don't know what it means to be Messiah. And from this point forward in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel is going to be occupied with Jesus defining what Messiah means to his disciples and to those around him. And they're not going to get it. They're not going to get it. And they're not going to get it. And even in, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, at the Mount of Ascension, the disciples come to Jesus and say, and say to him, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They still don't get it. But it's understandable, don't you see? Looking for so many years, they've been looking for this man, this, this military leader to throw off oppression, to throw off the, the yoke of Rome. And here comes Jesus, and Peter confesses him, you're the guy, you're the guy. And Jesus says, here's what it means to be the guy. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to die. And three days later, I'm going to be raised. And that doesn't fit with their mindset of what Messiah means. We're going to be looking at that over the next several weeks. Uh, next week, when we get into the, the uh, in verse 21, where he strictly charged them, commanding them to tell nobody, and then on to the cost of following Jesus, on to the transfiguration, and looking at that, and what God says, the Father saying to Jesus after, after Peter has said, no, 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 you've got it wrong. Jesus takes him up on a hill and God says to Peter, listen to him. Listen to what he's saying to you. Even if you don't like it, Peter, listen to him when he's talking to you about dying. Listen, pay attention. He knows what he's talking about. 
and how hard the disciples struggle and try to understand this because it doesn't fit with what they've been thinking all along, all this time. But that's for next week. This week, we need to talk about application of last week because we didn't get to it. We ended up uh, sort of cutting off in the, in the, in the middle. And, and a couple of weeks ago, I said to Bill Moore that I was going to make this statement in Bible class. Bill Moore is in his right mind. And those of you who know Bill can chuckle and laugh at that statement. But we have in back in Luke chapter 8, in the Gerasene demoniac scene where Jesus has cast out the legion of demons and the 5,600 plus demons out of this man. In verse 35, the people from the area come out to see what has happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus and in his right mind. And they were afraid. If I'm outside of Christ, I'm not in my right mind. My mind is where it shouldn't be. It's focused on the wrong things. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. Just making sure we're not going to run too terribly over here. Ephesians 4 and verse 17 now I say, this I say and testify in the Lord that you no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. And Frank's been talking in, 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 in teaching through Mark about the hardness of the hearts of the disciples and the futile way they're thinking about Jesus. And that's really what they're what they're going to do when it comes to understanding what Jesus is as Messiah, because they, they can't get it out of their heads, this idea that that means guy with a sword on a white horse leading them into battle against Rome. It's, a, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. And here comes Jesus saying, you had it wrong from the start. This is what Messiah means. But anyway, if, I'm, if I am outside of Christ... My mind is in the wrong place. Paul writes in Colossians chapter uh, 3, verse 2, to set our minds on things above. Where, God, where Christ is seated in, in heaven with God. Set our minds there. If I'm going to be in Jesus, it means I'm going to be in my right mind. My mind is finally going to be focused on the right things in life. So if someone tells you you're out of your mind, just say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm in Christ. I'm where my mind needs to be. Secondly, God is not limited by my inadequacy. In Luke chapter 9, verse 13, the disciples are looking at the five loaves and the two fish, and they're saying it's not enough. It's not enough. Has anyone ever felt inadequate in the ministry that God has given them? And thinking, I, I, I'm not enough for this. And you're right, you're not. But with God working through you, you are sufficient because you're in your right mind and you're focused on the right things and you're carrying out the ministry that God has given you. Uh, I, I mentioned way back when, when I started preaching in Schenectady and I was thinking to myself, who am I to be teaching these people that taught me when I was a kid and, and allowed me to stumble along and, and, and make as many mistakes as I made. If I rely on myself, I'm going to be insufficient to the task. If I rely on God, then the task will be completed. Maybe not by me, but by someone else. You know, the, God is going to complete his purposes. You remember Jairus, when he heard the message, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. He could have relied on, he could have, latched onto that and held on to that and said, okay, there's no hope. But in his hopelessness turns to Jesus and takes him to his home and receives his daughter back from the dead. God isn't hampered by my insufficiencies and my inadequacies. Uh, when Paul is talking in Corinthians saying, I I'm going to boast in my weakness because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. 
because it's God who strengthens him. It's God who works through him. It's God who makes him strong. And finally, the question that Jesus asks in Luke chapter uh, 9 and verse 20, who do you say that I am? I think that's a question that each of us needs to ponder and, and answer in our own minds. What is Jesus to us? Who is Jesus to us? Is he the God in a box that we keep up there in case of emergency break glass and take down and in times of in times of trouble? Is he the, the Barney, the dinosaur, Jesus who loves us and, and we love him and, and everything's going to be hunky-dory and I don't have to change a, a, a lick of my life to be acceptable to him? Who is he? Uh, I was preaching in Rome yesterday saying that who he is to you is going to be seen in how his word works out in your life. So when others are looking at you, do they see Jesus? And that's one of those questions that kind of makes you uncomfortable to, to ask yourself because it, it gets kind of real at that point. Next week, Luke chapter 9, 21 to 50. We're not going all the way to 50. We'll probably make it to the end of the transfiguration. I'm going to stop the recording.